Well, thank you. And yes, it's always a, a pleasure getting to share some insights and hopefully, especially building on the conversation that we just had on the panel and also trying to integrate some of the points that have been raised through the other presenters. So if y'all will bear with me, I admit, despite having worked with security researchers on cutting edge technology issues for uh, if we really did the math, it's probably close to 20 years now. Uh, I am at times very technology challenged. So uh, again, bear with me as I get the slides up and we'll be able to kind of take a little bit of a fun ride through what uh, really what was a um, exciting and very dense uh, executive order. So when we start talking about some of the, you know, for example, the executive order that came out and you look at like any great adventure story, essentially, um, it's a treasure hunt. And where a treasure hunt where C marks compliance, riddles and clues and uh, pitfalls abound, you can't go on a treasure hunt without a decoder ring. And while we talk about regulating and discuss some of the issues with regulating cybersecurity, well, let's view the cybersecurity executive order that came out as its own adventure. And an adventure that stretches across federal agencies, starts state and local governments, and goes deep into the private sector reaches, sometimes in unexpected ways. So fitting together the existing efforts that different uh, regulatory bodies, both within the US as well as abroad, have been working on some of these cybersecurity and device security issues, taking in new rules that will be coming out of this executive order. And in some cases, new players, well, let's just say, shall the adventure begin? And as we talked about before, my background is on that big picture, IoT landscape. So during my tenure with the city of Atlanta, I was responsible for integrating all kinds of different projects into the world's busiest airport. So using and picking on the aviation industry a little bit, you look at all the different landscapes. So we talk about what the pitfalls and what the treasure map looks like and where you need the decoder ring, then one of the places you look at is what exactly are we talking about? So when we talk about the aviation industry, we talk about, well, what happens at home when you start you know, researching, booking your flight, the payment systems, what, what does it take to then get you to the airport? through the airport system, working with the airlines, then the avionic systems and all those different things that go into the flight. Then you talk about all the different pieces of the arrival to the transit and to your destination. So that's a pretty fraught landscape. If we're gonna talk about the treasure map that's there, you can start seeing where in supply chain, basically the ecosystem, so as Eric mentioned during the last panel, the ecosystem of care, how does that fit into, well, quite frankly, uh, what I like to call the gold rush of regulating cybersecurity that came out of the executive order 14028. So in May, we had the executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity. Well, okay, now that sounds like a mouthful. And not only that, it's a 30 page executive order that is a very dense executive order that's focused on you know, improving the nation's cybersecurity and protecting federal government networks. Well, okay, but let's break it down. If we're talking about the ecosystems of care and the healthcare industry, for example, you have like, how does it apply to me? Well, start dialing it in a little bit. We look at how they're encouraging private sector companies to take these measures to augment and align. Well, okay, that's still, so now we know where we're trying to get to 
a little bit, but, and I apologize for the word salad. I've, I've got links to everything, but you start to see where 30 pages, where this is a very complicated map. Uh, and treasure hunt. You have information sharing. You have, okay, stronger cybersecurity standards in the federal government. All right. All right. We have improving uh, software supply chain security. And the sneak tease from the panel discussion, that's where we're really going to take a deeper dive. But you have the uh, establishing the safety review board, creating this playbook, government-wide endpoint detection response systems, and improving the investigative and remediation capabilities. So, all right, we've got all these different pieces, but how do you make sense from that? And again, it's a 30 page, lots of steps, and there are lots of X's where X marks this spot, then the next spot. It requires collaboration between government-related entities. It requires Got a collaboration in some cases between all these different efforts, because none of this is happening in a vacuum. If you go on a treasure hunt, if you have an adventure story, you know, there's always a backstory. It's never just this single event. There's always the tall tales that get told in the tavern late at night. Well, you know, this all relates, Jim back to these different pieces. So keeping in mind that some of these efforts, including, you know, we had, uh, Eric had also mentioned the Joint Cyber uh, Security Working Group coming out with frameworks. You know that the uh, FA, FDA has been working on all these different things. So in this 30 pages, in all these collaborations of those seven key steps, you had 46 tasks that came out. And according to the best research seen, 19 have been confirmed completed. 11 of those are still open. So we're not even sure where we are necessarily within the process. But if you break it down and start looking at, kind of dig a little deeper, dive into the map, and you'll see that in section four of the executive order, it starts getting to four, basically four, four projects within that that really start impacting the healthcare industry and that it's best practices for software supply chain security. But not only do you have NIST working on that, but you also have uh, the Office of Management Budget then enforcing the procurement compliance. Because as with every good treasure hunt, as with every good decoder ring story, you know that, and again, kind of going back to, it's the power of the purse, that we can create best practices, we can create all these different things, but how do you enforce it? Well, here's how we found out, let's do it through, uh, let's do it through, again, the power of the purse. But we also have identify and protection of critical software where NIST came out with their definitions, updating the FAR requirements for the purchase of new software um, and remediation of previously purchased software. Hmm. First clue, probably gonna need to look at that and to ensure NIST guidelines are followed by vendors. But every treasure map has the gold star. We have the pilot programs for security, uh, labeling for IoT devices and consumer software. So, all right, we've dug a little bit deeper. We have figured out some of those four, but are there, as in, again, any good adventure story has, there's gonna be false flags. There's going to be those red herrings. And what do we mean by that? Well, since this hasn't been, this executive order came out and looking at building that information sharing, that it's looking at how do we build and protect these government systems? How do we, you know, both remove these contract barriers from reporting issues, sharing data that, uh, especially for healthcare, where you have a system that's built on privacy and data protection, where you don't necessarily want all of the information. When I talk about the aviation industry, that's one of the issues they've had is, well, if we tell you where the vulnerabilities are in our systems, somebody else could do it, which in itself is a red herring and perhaps a false flag. But when you have an executive order that's 
empowering through the power of the purse, this information sharing, and all these other uh, projects have been going out. You know, how does this fit in and overlay into prior systems or prior research and ongoing, you know, the CMMC, you have all these other contracting and device management with the work the FDA has been doing. So, okay, how does that then, that shift, that treasure map, that adventure that's building on now protecting and better protecting the government and the critical systems, how does that fit within the healthcare landscape? And how does that come into play, again, in that ecosystem of care? Because we're, we're not talking about just those, as all of you know, you know, we're not talking about just one incident, that there's an entire supply chain. So if we're protecting the supply chain, well, what does that mean when we start talking about the healthcare system and how do we identify all the different pieces? Because when you look at, okay, of course, patient records, all these different IoT devices, but what about the IoT connected cameras that are set up for security within the hospital, physical security? Well, those are connecting to networks. Hmm. How, how are we purchasing those? One of the, uh, again, picking on the aviation industry a little bit, uh, where we've seen some of the biggest ransomware attacks that have uh, crippled airports that have hit, um, in some cases, some issues within the supply chain that have hit um, airlines have been those vendors, the payment systems. You see the mage cart, you see uh, in a couple of the big UK airport incidents, ransomware attacked, no, not the avionics, not this, no, it took down the signage system. So all of those electronic displays that told you where the next flights were, that told you, you know, directions, what time uh, that you're connecting flight again, all of those went down. And you think of that tiny little ripple effect that uh, the, you then have airport workers standing with whiteboards, directing people to where they go that all of that, yes, they're a piece of the ecosystem. And they can have, you know, and as we discussed on the panel, when you have one of those, not just relating to the big picture, but one of those smaller pieces, okay, that can have just as big and, you know, all the best modeling doesn't necessarily pick up on that. So when we talk about all the different connected devices, the software that's running them, and all these different pieces of the supply chain, you realize that especially when it comes to healthcare, it may not be the pieces that we were already looking at. It may be these smaller little incidents and these smaller little things that fit into it that we now have to pay attention to and should because again, it goes back to the risks. And when you talk about that every good treasure hunt, again, is fraught with risk, that we have the attack surface we were just discussing, where it's an average 10 to 15 networked medical devices per hospital bed. And you think of all the vendors who you're working with that then connect to that, all the different software providers. So maybe the scheduling system that you use, uh, the talk going back to the aviation industry, when you have iPads that pilots are using for navigation uh, and general aviation, that all of these little things, and it's not just a, you know, putting money behind some of the risks, it, depending on how, you know, with the electronic records, up to $1,000 per stolen medical record, and that the healthcare industry itself ranks as one of the highest data breach costs according to uh, the latest numbers. So, all right, we know a little bit of that uh, kind of landscape, but what really are the risks? What are we really trying to calculate here? And if you look at the IBM Securities cost of a data breach report, it talks about how the 
healthcare data breach costs increased 29.5% over the 2020 numbers. That it's not just that risk, but you're looking at the vulnerabilities and third-party software as an attack vector. So again, highlighting while you may have protected all these different systems and everything within your healthcare ecosystem, did you look at and how well have you vetted the third-party software? Because at 14% of the breaches are caused by that. So that's no wonder from the executive order standpoint, it looks at, and I know we've had presentations that have gone over, you know, SBOM and that supply chain attack. But when we talk about its application to the healthcare industry and the average cost, but also when you look at an industry that has a high strict regulatory requirements, such as healthcare, that depending on the level of compliance, basically you're one, going to see the impacts from these breaches occur uh, much further down the road. So it's not the immediate, but also looking at whether you've complied and where those are, it also is a big difference, for example, and if you're compli- meeting those direct regulatory, whether your actual breach costs go up or go down. But one of the executive orders uh, pillars was including the implementation of zero trust. And when you hear all these different things, you say, okay, well, sure, 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 we'll get around to it. But what kind of expedites and makes us even, you know, brings it to the top of, well, okay, if we have a mature zero trust uh, plan and environment without the cost difference of the breaches. So where it's going to hit, again, that power of the purse is suddenly you have 42.3% higher costs if you have, or excuse me, if you don't have uh, a zero trust model and versus if you do have a very mature one. So, okay, we know that one, this executive order put all kinds, those seven key things where you have the, you know, knowing who you're working with, building in and building in some critical key functions at the basic level that you know that, all right, at least what it's requiring from federal expenditures and where the federal modeling and the federal power of the purse, but, and you know that healthcare has, all right, yes, it's a high risk, highly regulated um, industry, but again, what happens when then you've got all these different players that we're suddenly bringing in together as well? So what happens when we've brought these players in And we've called in these existing things. Well, the problem, what are the problems and one of the challenges, and particularly when you're looking at how to implement and the impact of this is it's an executive order. It's not legislation in the sense of it's not a law. Again, it's that executive, it is coming through. So what are some of the existing issues where when we talk about the challenges for the FDA. So the FDA in response to the executive order came through and said, all right, here's the position paper we highlight. Don't forget, we have these existing frameworks. We have these existing guidelines and here's how they're going to play together and provided some nice next steps to go through that. But when it comes to enforcing you have to look at the limitations of the regulatory authority. You have to look at, for example, all the different pieces that come into it. And when you're talking about uh, the electronic health records, you know, to really regulate beyond that requires taking it to that next step of going beyond an executive order. So what can this executive order do? And what can it do? Well, 
And we've hinted, we've talked about it. Again, it's the purchasing power. So when you have, for example, a 70 billion IT purchasing power of the federal government, that's going to start having a ripple effect. That is going to get people's attention. And if you're trying to navigate this adventure of, well, how does that impact healthcare? Because of course we have the other agency regulations that you have to comply with in a federal government, but healthcare isn't always all of those pieces. It goes down to the little doctor's offices. Uh, it goes down to the support mechanisms, the software developers whose software maybe use these, that supply chain, those other vendors who may not just be working in the healthcare system. And they say, okay, well, I don't, I'm developing a solution. I am providing research. I am providing all these different things that fit into this, but I don't take federal funds or I'm not working on a federal contract. I'm not doing that. Well, okay. We're talking about systems used or operated by an agency, an agency contractor or by an, another organization on behalf of the agency. So when you start thinking, okay, well, huh, now we're bringing, and now we're seeing where more of that is going to begin to play. Some of those regulations, some of those requirements, some of those pieces start fitting in a little bit more, but not only that, let's take it a little bit further and let's dig a little bit deeper, but it's those acquisition. And when you talk about the federal ac uh, acquisition regulations and you look at, and again, putting back on my former state and local government hat, well, it wasn't just that we may or may not be using programs that receive federal funding, that this would come into play. Uh, basically, state and local governments build out their programs. We don't always have the expertise to be able to vet or understand all the complexities of an issue. And so what we do with that is we then say, okay, let's go by what the feds are doing. Let's look at how they're approaching something. And that's when the adventure begins. You see how this starts impacting a little bit more. So where are we now? Most recently, NIST pushed its, uh, published its guidelines for enhancing the software uh, supply chain. Great, we're starting to meet. Again, there's 11 of the deadlines haven't hit yet, but okay, all right, what do we need to do to keep on track? Call it the comply or get out, and the gold star marks the spot. Well, what do we mean by that? If you go and look at, for example, the software supply chain security practices, uh, come close to May 2022, OMB is going to start impacting the power of the purse. They're going to take, if you haven't met some of those supply chain security practices and incorporate them into your contracts, uh, worked and added them there, then you're not going to be able to meet the, uh, I got procurement. And keeping in mind, it's not just the federal side, it's that ripple down effect, trickle down effect. And the security labeling. And you look at, you know, one of the next ones was, all right, that energy star, the gold star marks the spot. Well, in early February, 2022, that's when we first hit the pilot program for security, the gold star labeling for IoT devices and secure software development practices. Come May, need to take a bigger look at that because that's when the pilot programs and the summary reports are coming out. And that's where you can start expecting the next part of section four, where the purchasing. So again, looking at within one year, of that. So again, what seemed like this treasure map, we're starting to get closer to X marking the spot because you have to look at the critical software guidance. You look at if you're not meeting the guidelines, then you start to hit the issue because X marks the spot as you start building in the encryption, the software Excuse development. Me, just, yeah. Just, uh, we're, we're getting close to, oh, we're just going to end the end time. Even so better, <laughs> the exceptions and exceptions and exceptions 
because as we see, you can get exemptions, you can apply for exceptions. Legacy systems are going to run together and that it's not a treasure map. It is not a secure, it's not a cybersecurity executive order and it's not healthcare. If you can't exempt or ex get exceptions out, pay attention to that. So there you go. You know, I only gave you a small heart attack. I'm sorry. Perfect. Thank you. Very I meant much to give you the warning. I'm like, we're right there. <laughs> I promise. And just just one very quick question. The question that sprung to my mind as well, um, to Chris and Michael Richardson, is that 14% of breaches came from third party. Uh, and Michael's question is: so the other 86% uh, percent came from first party and second, you know, second party software. You know, kind of, yeah. so I think. I think that's something that we need to take up in the breakout group. Yeah, but, uh, Absolutely, because yeah, it's yeah. actually more where they track it to, whether it was um, internal threats, um, somebody like a disgruntled um, employee, right. stuff like that. So it wasn't necessarily software, but yeah, 